Welcome. I, I am so excited to see such a large group. My name is Dawn Kuahara, and I am from Sonoma Valley Hospital. And I welcome all of you to Active Aging, Live Your Best Life Now. So this is a uh, collaboration of Vintage House and Sonoma Valley Hospital. We've been working on this for several months. And we're just really excited about providing you insight and information on how to get the most out of your senior years. I call it active aging or healthy aging. So I'd like to uh, thank a few people here in the room, Celia Cruz de la Rosa and Marisa Fitrakis. They're from Sonoma Valley Hospital and Vintage House and they are the coordinators of this event. They've worked really hard to put this together. And we have volunteers from the hospital and from Vintage House. And then our media support, the Sun and the radio in the Index Tribune. So a lot of people worked really hard to put this together and much thanks to the hospital and Vintage House too. So at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Dan Stites. He is on the Board of Directors of Vintage House. Thank you. Welcome to all of you. Thank you, Dawn, very much. Um, it's a pleasure for me to um, have you all here for what I think is going to be a very exciting lecture today and it'll be followed up in the weeks to come by some more exciting programs. Just for, for fun, can I see a show of hands of those of you in the audience who are members of the Vintage House? Wow. Those of you who aren't are missing something special and on the way, way out there's a brochure on how to join the Vintage House which you can pick up. Well, I'm delighted to have Louis, Professor Louise Aronson from the University of California at San Francisco as our primary kickoff speaker for this program. Louise was born and raised in San Francisco. Her father was an ophthalmologist who I knew on the faculty of the university where I also worked. She is currently professor of medicine and chief of geriatrics education. She graduated from Brown University and Harvard Medical School. She holds an endowed professorship at the University of California, which having worked in the place for 35 years is a darn hard thing to get, and she's to be congratulated for that. She holds the gold professorship in humanism and medicine and also works as a doctor, providing primary care, home hospital and hospice care to homebound older adults through the UCSF Care at Home program, and incidentally directs the Northern California Geriatrics Education Center and the UCSF Medical Humanities program. You can see this is a very busy person. She also happens to have a master's degree in fine arts and is a published author, having written articles uh, and a book which, for which she won um, an award. Her articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, medical articles in the New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet. She wrote a fictional book called A History of the Present Illness, which was nominated for a major award, and speaks regularly to many groups about her two greatest passions, aging and public writing to improve health and health care. She's won many awards, so many I can't list them all, but a couple of important ones are the California Home Care Physician of the Year Award, and the Alpha Omega Alpha Edward Harris Professionalism Award, and finally the American Geriatric Society Clinician Teacher of the Year Award. I'd like to welcome Louise uh, and look forward so much to hearing you talk. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. 
Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here. If nothing else, I got to leave my office in the middle of the day, drive for a beautiful hour, and then be with all of you. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the next hour, and I'm very honored to be kicking off this series. I'm going to do a couple of things today, talking about active aging in two different ways. One is I want to activate you, because there are ways where we can all make a huge difference for our aging and for our society. And the other is to talk about how you, ways in which you can be more active to improve your own life. But I'm actually going to start by telling you a story. Um, let me just check. Are you hearing me OK? There's a little echo at my end. You're good. OK. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story. This is a story of a 101-year-old patient. And he goes in to see his doctor. And the doctor says, so why are you here? And he says, well, my right knee is hurting. And I'm just not able to do what I want to do. So the doctor asks some more questions. And the man, he hasn't fallen down. There's, there's no obvious reason. So he says, well, we'll hop up on the table. Guy hops up on the table. He moves the leg. You know how, how we do it. Move the leg up and down, sideways, all this stuff. Can't really find anything. So he says to the man, well, you know, what do you expect? You're 101. And the man looks at him, 101-year-old, and he looks at the doctor, and he says, yeah, but my left knee is 101 too, and it doesn't bother me a bit. <laughs> so one of the big problems with aging is that people use it as an excuse for not doing their jobs or not making the world a better place for all of us. Uh, and hopefully I will inspire you to make a difference in that way. So when we hear about aging, we usually get one of two stories. One is that if you eat your blueberries and kale, you will be happy 24-7, and you will have successfully aged. And the rest of us who aren't happy 24-7 are failures, clearly. Uh, so I don't really like that one so much. The other one is this. That's the silver tsunami, and it's coming to get us all, right? And what do tsunamis do? They destroy civilizations and individuals. They're pretty much universally bad. Uh, so I don't really like that one either. And those are the two ways most people think about aging. This you may recognize. You, I don't know what you see. Maybe you see a glass half full or a glass half empty. In looking this up to find this photograph, I actually found my favorite thing of all, which is that it's always 100% full. It's just half water and half air, which I never thought of, actually, uh, and is pretty great. So my point here is that it's both, obviously. But also, what's in there and who you are really matters in, in terms of whether you want this or you think half full is good or bad, right? So what if I were to tell you, yeah, it's half full and you have to drink it, but what's in there is bowel prep, right? What you take before you have a colonoscopy. So then you're thinking, well, thank God there's only half a glass, right? Or it's river runoff or something like that. Or if I tell you you're not thirsty. Or maybe you're really thirsty, and you're a little sad that there's half a glass. But the people around you aren't even getting any water. So then half a glass doesn't look too badly either. So part of what we need to do with aging is think about it in its more complex, multifaceted way. So let's get started on that, because it's a bit like this glass of water. Some of what I'm going to talk about comes from this report, which came out last month. It was commissioned by all the major organizations that deal with aging. Why? Because there's this huge issue, and we're not dealing with it very well. And for years now, we've been saying we're aging as a population, and nobody seems to care. And if you're talking about something important that's relevant to lots of people, and nobody gets it, then there's probably something wrong with the way you're talking about it. So this group, which has won a MacArthur Award, sort of like those genius awards, is working on how do we think about this better. So one thing they found is that there are myths, five myths. And the first one is that aging is all bad. There's just nothing good about it. And you'll see this in articles and pleas by people who will say it's a crisis, right? Or well, of course, it's terrible. You know, you lose function, and you get old, and then you die. And, and so we need to do better with it. But even that is seeing only the bad. Well, it turns out there's actually lots of 
good things about aging. And we literally don't see them. People are blind to them. So I can see that some people recognize this guy. I was very fond of him years ago. Uh, so just the facts. So what are some facts about aging? Well, one is, if you look at degrees of happiness, middle-aged people are much more likely to be depressed than older people. Rates of happiness increase with age, by and large. Are there exceptions? Are there situations in which people aren't happy? Yes, in all age groups. But overall, older people are happier. Confidence. This is a great one. Uh, this actually starts in people's 50s. And they start just feeling more comfortable with who they are, what they like, what they don't like, what they're going to put up with, what we're not going to put up with, right? I can feel this already, and it's fun, right? Yeah, the, body, the body's doing some things that are a little disappointing. But it's, it's pretty fun to feel more confident and more comfortable in who you are. And we don't celebrate that or take advantage of it as well as we might. Time. My colleagues are all talking about how they don't have any time. There's not enough time for the children. There's not enough time for work. There's not enough time for exercise. There's not enough time for anything. And one of the things as we get older is that there is more time. Now, for some people, this is a problem. But part of that is how we deal with it as a society. But by and large, we have more time to do those things we always wanted to do. Or maybe things we never wanted to do because it never occurred to us to do them. Time is a good thing. There's less stress. So stress levels go down because there isn't the juggling, on the one hand, of the kids and the mortgage and the job and the this and the that and the other. There's less of that juggling. Uh, there's also less trying to prove points. Um, I keep thinking of our governor in that regard, although he still he keeps, he's, he's still going after uh, big prizes. But for the most part, that striving, that needing to prove who you are in the world is less there. And it's more about what would I like to do or what would I like to contribute? Knowledge. Older people know more. They have bigger vocabularies. They have a greater library of experience to draw upon. And this relates to the next thing, which is emotional intelligence. There are more and more studies that as we age, we become more perceptive about our own emotions, other people's emotions, and more intuitive about what's really going on. I mean, if you think of all the fighting and haggling about everything that's going on in the world, imagine if we actually harnessed this emotional intelligence and used it to advantage. So there are some good things. There are many other good things I'm going to point out as I go along. But my point is, all we ever hear about is, right, the wrinkle the slowing down. You don't hear so much about all those things. And that makes people think it's exclusively negative when it is not. So you might recognize this guy too. So this is Rembrandt. And he actually wasn't that old when he died. He was in his mid-60s. But the important thing to know there is that at the time when he died, most people died in their early 40s. So he was actually very old. And if you look at his work, this is him, you know, sort of young, middle-aged, and older. His use of light is tremendous throughout. And if you look at lists of what are his 10 best paintings, according to all critics, at least half are painted in his older years. Was he moving more slowly? Yes. Was he making permanent contributions to who we are as a culture? Yes. OK, so the first myth was that aging was all bad. The second myth is that the baby boomers are a demographic blip, right? It's this aberrant thing that's happening. It's a one-off in history. So we just have to power through it, right? That silver tsunami is going to hit, and then it will wash over. And if you're still standing, it's going to be great. Well, here's the thing. So this is the United States in 2006. But really, throughout most of history, I'll, I'll just show you how to read this. It's just male and female on either side. And as you go up, people get older. So these are infants and toddlers, and here are people over age 85. So throughout most of history, this was a rectangle. Tons of kids, tons of young people, and fewer and fewer people as we get older. Now you can see when the baby boomers come along, this part that always was only down here is moving up. 
but you can also see that the next couple generations are moving up too, because all those babies, they had babies too. They didn't have quite as many, but they had a lot of babies. So human history is moving in this way where we're no longer going to have what we call a pyramid. Lots and lots of kids and very few older people. What we're going to have is more of a rectangle, which means there are lots of people at all ages. And we need to start thinking about what that means for what we build and what we do and who works and what we value. And we haven't really thought about that. And that is a huge opportunity for creativity and productivity and engagement. It's a real change in human history. And it's not going away. So when people say to you, oh, well, we just, you know, it's this boomer thing. It's not this boomer thing. It's the new normal. All right. So now we have a myth that things are bad and a myth that this population thing is temporary. It's not. The third one is that aging is an individual problem. This one particularly gets me down because several times a week I hear from patients I don't know or from their adult children saying, oh my gosh, we're in crisis. I get emails, I get phone calls, same with all my colleagues, because there's a crisis. And nobody knows how to deal with that crisis. There, aren't so, there are resources, but when you're a young parent with a kid who needs help, you know what to do and where to go. You can speak to your friends. But we leave people alone and we make them think, you know, we have schools that, that educate everybody. We have programs for people. We make people feel that they have to deal with the hard parts of aging on their own. Whereas actually, if we had systems and structures, they would not. Um, let me give you, uh, well, I'll come back to that. So I'll, I'll talk here a little bit about adolescence. So the invention of the teenager. Did you realize teenagers were invented? They actually were. So there were not teenagers through most of human history. It simply, they didn't exist. You were a child and then you were an adult. People married and had their own children in their teens. They did a little bit of school and then they went off to work. Then the Industrial Revolution happened. And after a period of time, people kept saying, well, we, we shouldn't abuse these children. And then there started to be more time. And as there was more time, this, these teenage years developed. And the, the term didn't really come into play until the 1920s. That's really recent, right? That's a century ago. And we've been around for millennia. And now, can you imagine life without teenagers? I mean, so much is built around them. There's, there's their music. There's what they do. It's a huge part of who we are as a society. Well, let's think about aging now. Throughout most of human history, humans died in their 30s or 40s. And now, on average, an American will live to age 78. And if you're already in your 70s, chances are you're going to live to your 80s, 90s, or 100s. We have never had so many people in their 100s. In fact, what we hear these days is that older adults, people over age 65, are the second fastest growing segment of the population. The fastest growing group, over age 85, right? So we're getting older. That means there's this whole new phase. Let's think about the first 18 years of life. So you have neonate, infant, toddler, child, tween, and teen. That's six words for what is you know, a 15 to 18 year process. What do we have for age 62? The oldest patient I've taken care of is 112, right? So that's over 50 years. And we have words, but we use one word for all those people from age 60 to 112. One word. And actually, we're not even in agreement about which word, right? <laughs> NPR did this great study last year looking at the words about aging, whether it was senior or older adult or golden or you know all these words, right? Nobody liked any of them, right? So we're lumping everybody together and there's so much ageism and negativity that nobody even likes any of the words. But it's also true that maybe somebody in their 60s or 70s or 80s, depends on how healthy and, and active you are, has had one career and now is doing something different. And that's different from someone who actually retires. There's this whole new phase of life. It turns out, as we're living longer, the period of disability is getting shorter. That means the period of productivity, the period of opportunity and engagement, and all the things we can do is getting longer. 
And it's kind of a collective failure of imagination to not create opportunities and structures. Yes, it may not be what you did or even wanted to do at 40 or 50, but imagine if we had opportunities for people to take advantage of all those positives we talked about, of all the energy that people have. Imagine if we had an invention, if 100 years from now, somebody says the invention of the, you know, what is it? One of the stages of being older because we're gonna to have to come up with new stages. There are multiple stages of being older. Even for those of you who are moving through older years, what, who you are at 60 is different than 70, is different than 80, is different than 90. And that should have significance and it should probably have words and opportunities and structures. Okay, the fourth one, the fourth thing the Frameworks Group found was that people didn't really think about ageism. Right? Maybe you're wondering, what is ageism? Maybe you're not. But it's like sexism or racism. It's a bias against people because of who they are by virtue of age. And you hear about this in the workplace, but it's actually pretty much everywhere. In medicine, we see this all the time. So last fall, there was a national organization about aging that released a video about falling, trying to get, oh, no, about the flu shot. So they wanted people to go for the flu shot, which is paid for uh, once you're on Medicare. So they have this actress, it wasn't a great actress, but a, a sort of television actress, who looks gorgeous, and she goes to the doctor's office to get her flu shot. And there's this handsome young man behind the counter, and he's refusing, and they're kind of flirting. And he's basically, eventually he outright says that she's, she's too young to get a flu shot. You know, she looks too good. As if being old is looking bad, or be, looking good is being young, right? And this was from an aging organization, right? They wanted to encourage people to get the flu shot. And I looked at it, I thought, oh my god, you know, how can this be happening? Uh, there was also a prize announced, a million dollar prize for people to cure aging, right? So let's, let's think about something else that, that, that's kind of difficult. Well, all right, cure aging. So could we cure adolescence? Could we cure childhood? I mean, I don't have little kids right now, but I have colleagues who do. It's a ton of work, right? They keep them up, they scream, they need to be fed and clothed and all these things. We need to cure this childhood thing because it is just a drag on people. They can't get any work done. They can't get any sleep, right? So, so now we have a prize to cure a normal part of the human life cycle. Uh, there were some other things, too. There, there was a study that looked at people in their 90s who had a, a procedure on a heart valve. And what they found was they lived longer than they expected them to. So the procedure kind of helped. And you might think, wow, that's great. Except maybe if you're really ill and you're in your 90s, living longer may not be the only thing that matters to you, right? Did they get to go home afterwards? Or did they have to live in a nursing home? Were they still able to walk? How was their thinking after that surgical procedure, right? So ageism comes in all these different clothings, right? Uh, to really think about old age, you'd have to think what matters to the person at that stage of life. And it may not just be being alive for a few more months. It may be what is that life like? And we often don't ask the right questions. So, ageism is something people don't see and they do inadvertently. <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of, it's striking, but it's truly horrible. Uh, and people tend to deny it. Um, I have been in, in medical audiences where interesting things happen. So. Yeah, so I should read for people who can't see, it says, best before March 1973. So one of our deans, an education dean a few years ago, we were discussing a case. And the case was the so-called geriatrics case. The, the patient in question was 60. The dean in question was, I don't know for sure, but I'm gonna guess 64. So she kept talking about the geriatrics case and about this other thing Literally, no irony, no sense of humor, no nothing. I mean, just clueless. 
You know, and, and what was the person? You know, it was a 59, 60 year old woman, essentially a middle aged woman who was working and then had to deal with her grandchildren as well. And, and this whole conversation went on about the geriatrics case. Uh, there was another instance at one of our hospitals where somebody presented the case of a very old sick person that had come in from a nursing home. And a very senior clinician stood up and said, and I mean very senior in both ways, like experienced and not so young, and said, I know what the solution is. You don't build nursing homes within 100 miles of hospitals. And people laughed, right? Imagine if in this day and age you said, well, we're just not going to have female patients anymore. We're just not going to have patients with brown skin, right? People are allowed to say things and do things about older adults that they would not do for any other category of human being at this point in human history. And so we need to call them on that. We need to correct them. So ageism, it actually turns out to be everywhere. Fifth, so not surprisingly, people feel like we're doomed and there's nothing you can do about this because if you think about it, okay. So they're thinking it's all negative and it's gonna pass and there's really no ageism involved uh, and, and they just feel like there's nothing that can be done. In fact, there's something called the longevity dividend, right? And dividends are good. Dividends mean you get money, right? You get money back, you get good things and the bigger the dividend, the better. Well, if you have more people, and each one comes with a longevity dividend, an ability to contribute and be involved in society, then you're gonna have a bigger dividend. And this is what we're not working on. And this should inform how we do everything, right? It should be about housing and transportation. Let me tell you about a little town in Florida. So they were having a bunch of accidents. Not a huge town. So thinking, why are we having these accidents? And it turned out to be mostly older drivers. Well, instead of just taking away everybody's licenses, somebody actually said, well, why is this happening? Turned out they changed the street signs and they were kind of harder to see. There was less contrast and they were a little smaller than they'd been previously. So to this town's credit, having caused a certain number of accidents by one decision, they actually made new signs yet again and they made them bigger and clearer. And what happened? The rate of accidents went way down and not just among the old, it helped everyone. Because how many times have you been driving and you're someplace you don't know? Just trying to get here today, it happened to me. I'm like, is this the street? You know, I've got the little machine talking to me. I can't tell if I'm on the right street. Um, so that helps everyone. What else does it mean? It means if people can still safely drive, they can still go to jobs. They can still go take care of their grandchildren. They can still go exercise. They can still go out to dinner or to the movies and pay money into the economy and live life and have life, lives that matter and be happier and more active and help every member of society. So changing signs is something we don't do individually. That's something we do collectively and it's a small example of what we might do on a bigger scale if we're not thinking the whole time that we're doomed. So this guy you might also recognize, Steve Jobs, with uh, a computer. So computers are not that dissimilar from aging maybe, or at least from how people think about aging. The first computers did very specific things. They mostly did it for mostly young men with a particular set of interests. And they were big ugly things, right? And Steve Jobs, among others, but, but particularly him for the second thing, said two things. One, he said, the limits of what this thing can do are the limits of our imagination. And two, just because something serves a function doesn't mean it has to be ugly, right? <laughs> so I think of this when I go into patients' houses, as I did yesterday, and there was this big metal handle by her front door. Lovely house that she's taken care of over decades. That doesn't have to be big and ugly, right? She could have a handle there that would be part of the decoration, right? And frankly, if they were making that handle for a 30-year-old, they'd sell it, look, you know, it wouldn't sell if it didn't look better. So that is the limit of our imagination. So we're not doomed, and there's lots we can do, but we have to try. Okay, so coming to the end of the first half, which is really about getting active politically, with how you spend your money, with how you spend your time, with what you say to other people. So specifically, recognize, emphasize, and celebrate the good. We do this ourselves. 
I've reached an age where I'm not considered old yet, but where things are changing. And do I gripe about them? I do. Do I talk as often about all the great things that have happened? I probably don't. So this has gotten me thinking. We all are part of this, and we need to reframe the conversation. Educate others about our new demography. When they say it's a blip, when they say this is a temporary problem, explain to them that it's not. That it's the new normal to have an older society. That this matters to all of us right now and for the foreseeable future. Demand community and societal strategies for common challenges. If you're facing something, you're probably, in fact, you are certainly not the only one facing it. And yet we make people face these things alone. Right? For the same reason that the words about aging are not popular. People don't want to talk about this. But if we don't talk about it, if we don't insist on common solutions, we won't get them. Call out and counter ageism. By telling those stories to you, I'm starting to do that and you can tell them to others, plus your own stories. And spread the word that the greatest limitations of aging. Are there real limitations? There are. But we have dealt with, I mean, we put people on the moon, for goodness sake. We can do some of this other stuff. Come from our imagination and policies, not physiology. So you've got to think about how you vote, invest, advocate, educate, insist, and inspire. All right, shifting gears. So this guy here is a surgeon. He also writes for The New Yorker. His name is Atul Gawande. And he's written a book called Being Mortal, which is really trying to get us to think differently about aging. And one of the quotes I like from this is, we've been wrong about our, what our job is in medicine. We think our job is to ensure health and survival. But really, it's larger than that. It's to enable well-being. And well-being is about the reasons one wishes to be alive. Those reasons matter not just at the end of life or when debility comes, but all along the way. What I think this is saying, what we tend to say in geriatrics in my field, is that for a long time the healthcare system has focused on medicine as opposed to health. And health has to do with so many things, where you can go, what your transportation is, what you can eat, and how you live, right? He calls the book being mortal, so he's still thinking about how you die. We need to think more about how we live. And that's what I'm going to focus on in this second half. So, changes with age. This is Carmen. When that photograph was taken, she was 103 or 4. Wasn't entirely clear. That's her daughter-in-law, grandchildren, and great-grandson. And this was Honey, the attack chihuahua, who didn't actually bite me, but the dog's self-image was completely out of proportion to its size. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I mean, really, it comes along. It's crazy. Anyway. so. So what happens with age? I'm not going to go over every single change in your body, but I'm going to use a few examples um, that tell us about what, what changes and what doesn't and what we can do about it. So let's start with the brain, because that's a big area of concern for most people. Uh, actually, I was just shown a poem about uh, brain loss with aging. So for a long time, even when I started training you know, 20, 30 years ago, people would say, Oh, this person's senile, as if being senile, having dementia, in other words, and being old were synonymous. The risk goes up, but you don't get dementia by virtue of being old. Not everybody who's old will get it. So what's normal brain function as you get older? Well, it turns out it does change. People can learn just as well, but differently, right? So if you think about the implications of that, if you teach people in the same way and then you say they can't learn, it's not that they can't learn. It's that you've taught them in the wrong way. You see this with kids too, right? They have one way in this classroom and it appears this child can't do it and you teach them another way and they can do it. So it's the same with aging. It's also a little slower. The processing is slower. Uh, I had a student with me last week and we saw a patient who was 95 and I was seeing a couple of patients. So the student went in first and did some mental status testing on this patient. And I was really just having the student practice doing this because I knew I was pretty confident anyway that this patient didn't have any cognitive problems. So I was shocked when the student comes back and the person's score is really bad. And I thought, my god, I'm losing it, right? I'm, I'm like assessing this wrong. And this is why we have these tests. And it's terrible. And then it occurs to me, how has she done it? So we went back in and I did it again. But I waited, right? I asked questions and I waited a little longer. 
And it wasn't that the person couldn't answer the questions, it was that getting to them was a little slower. And she actually got a perfect score, right? So things happen more slowly, processing is more slow, people are more prone to distraction, do less well with distraction. Although I think we all do less well than these kids who are doing like eight things simultaneously, which I don't understand at all. But as you get old, you will have more trouble with distraction. You will have a little harder time getting to something. But normal aging means that you'll recognize it, right? You'll get to it eventually. You just need a little more time. So sometimes we think things are abnormal or that dementia, for example, is a normal part of aging. It's not, but being a little slower, having a little more trouble remembering where those keys are, that might happen. Okay, the eyes. People have more trouble with color, with night, uh, with peripheral vision as they age. And that's because the pupil doesn't open as much. It's not reacting in the same way. Well, what does this mean? This means you're going to need more light. Uh, but there are other things that can get better. So this is a way in which medicine can really make a difference. About 10 years ago in my family, all the people in their 70s had cataract surgery. Right? We all wear glasses, or at least we did. And then all the people in their 70s had cataract surgery, and then they didn't wear glasses anymore, and just those of us in our 40s and 50s wore glasses, right? So sometimes things change with age, and then medicine comes along and it invents pretty good things, and then you do even better than you were like decades earlier. So, so that's something else. There are always things evolving. We're always learning things in medicine. So don't just accept things as, this is happening to me inevitably. Ask, is this normal? Ask, what can we do about this in this day and age? Okay, next, ears. So as we know, as we get older, things move a little less well. Well, in the ear, it's basically made up of these little bones that are attached, and sort of like our knees and fingers, they don't move as well as they used to, and consequently, people don't hear as well as they used to. And by the time people are sort of much older, into their 80s, 90s, and 100s, almost everybody has some degree of hearing impairment as a result. Sort of the parts getting stiff and wearing down. Hearing aids are not a perfect solution, but they make a big difference. So here's the problem. We don't really pay for hearing aids, right? If, if you need a transplant, you know, if you need to be in the intensive care unit for months on end, we'll pay for that. But a hearing aid, we won't pay for. And that's a problem. So they actually did a great study at the, at the veterans hospital, I um, can't remember where, but a few years ago, where they took all the people on the waiting list for hearing aid and they tested them in terms of how depressed were they, how well did their brain work, how much were they getting out and being active and they got baseline levels. Then they took half the people randomly and they gave them hearing aids and the other half stayed on the wait list. Six months later, the people who got the hearing aids, lower levels of depression, lower levels of cognitive problems, right? Much more active and engaged, exercising more, more fit. The hearing aids made a huge difference in quality of life, in function, in people's activity. The one thing we know really helps people stay healthy and we don't pay for them. That too is ageist, right? That too is a policy that makes no sense. So sometimes you're suffering with something individually, but until we, until we start raising our voices saying, that's wrong, right? Why are you gonna pay for a medicine that's chance of helping me is almost nil and it costs $8,000 a month, but you won't buy me a hearing aid that will change my life tomorrow? That makes no sense. Same with teeth, right? Teeth, feet, ears, we don't really pay for them. What I would like to see is the people who make these rules, deprived of their own teeth, you know, something stuck in their ears and then they're not allowed to walk. Let's see how they like it. All right. So now I want to talk to you about taking a leap into active aging. So a leap. A, activity. L, learning. E, engagement. A, attitude. And P, planning. And this basically comes down to your body, your mind, your well-being, your mood, and your sense of control. All right, so we're going to go over each one. The first is exercise. And I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this because your next lecture is on this. But if exercise were a drug, it would be one of the most effective drugs we have. Right? It actually beats most drugs at almost all measures. Right? And 
it doesn't just treat one disease, right? I mean, probably some people in this room take medicines, and certainly we've all known people who've taken medicines, and here's the one for the blood pressure, and here's the other heart one, and here's the one for the diabetes, and here's the one to keep the bones strong, and wait, there's another one for the bones, and here's something for the breathing. Well, guess what? This one, this exercise drug, it'll treat every single one of those problems simultaneously, right? And how much it impacts it is greater than what most of those pills will do for you. Right, and you might be thinking, oh, but exercise, you know? It's a bit like dust, you know? You do it and then it comes back and you have to do it again and <laughs> that's a little frustrating. But we have to think of how to make it fun and exercise doesn't just mean going to the gym. You have to think what is it you'll enjoy or what is it you can pair it with that you'll enjoy, such as a friend who's really entertaining that you can do something with? Can you be dancing? Can you be walking? There is one other thing you should know about exercise as you get older, which is in young people, if they lift weights, they get stronger. And if they run, they get better aerobic capacity. In old people, if they do resistance training, if they do weights and things that really push on their muscles, they get both. Get, you get stronger and you get more aerobic capacity. So you actually get more benefits from certain exercises as you get older. Well, I could go on and on about this. It also treats things like falls, right? Falls are terrible. There was just a study this morning that I'm not gonna remember correctly, but one of the top causes of death and injury and institutionalization as we age is falls, right? And you hear about heart disease all the time and cancer lung disease. How often do you hear about falls? Well, two years ago, there were two big studies looking at everything we know about falls. And as is sometimes typical of a bunch of, you know, medical people in a room, they couldn't agree on much. But what both sets agreed on was the one thing that makes a huge difference, exercise. So if you do nothing else, exercise. All right, this is your brain exercising. <laughs> Isn't he cute? I know, very strong though. So this is learning, uh, but, but it's also exercise because it turns out one of the things that helps prevent dementia is, is exercise, physical exercise, as well as learning exercise, right? So back to the physical exercise also helps with dementia, but learning helps as well. If you think about it, whenever you learn something new, you're making more connections in your brain. And if dementia is losing connections, right? So let's imagine someone keeps learning and she's up here with all the connections she has and someone else sort of doesn't learn so much and she's here. And then they both are starting to get dementia so they go down. This one stays ahead, right? You can lose the same amount and still be ahead. And what they've found is people who keep learning can delay even if that's gonna happen to them. And then maybe you delay it so that it doesn't happen, right? Uh, something else happens. There's something else will happen to all of us, right? I mean, we sort of act like you can opt out. <laughs> and, and we can't. So the goal has to be to make life as good as it can be until something happens, because something will happen to all of us. Uh, but learning is a way of giving your life meaning while also helping your health. All right, this is the queen. She is 89 and she's still working. Now, admittedly, she has a fairly privileged life, probably more so than the rest of us in the room. Still, it might be that part of why she's still alive and active is because she's still active, right? She has a purpose and she has meaning and there is incredible data that having something, and it, it doesn't have to be, you know, presiding over a small kingdom in the Atlantic. Um, it, it can be, uh, you know, your grandkids need you, or you want to teach something, or you want to learn something, or you're coming here and teaching classes. I mean, I don't know. It could be so many different things, but what is it that gives your life meaning? That's going to be different for each one of us, but it's so important. So staying engaged. It's also true that people that have friends and networks and are engaged tend to have better health. It's not totally clear how that works, but it's clear that it's true. Now, some people are shy and they never had big social networks. 
So now there are computers, and that's actually helping some people. It's not clear, but it might be that that kind of connection helps too. And if you're engaging with the computer, you're engaging with something. So again, you need to adapt it to who you are. Okay, attitude. When they look, there, there's this great study of centenarians, so people in their hundreds. And when they look at them, they tend to have really positive attitudes. This makes me convinced I might not be 100, although I was pretty convinced of that anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but so, right, you know, so some of us have better attitudes than others of us. And that's a hard thing to fix. But what I take from this is there are two things that we can do differently. Try and actively think about, yes, these horrible things happen. And it might depend on how recent and how horrible, right? Sometimes horrible things happen and it's totally appropriate to be sad and angry and everything else. Um, but other times it's about saying, well, what's good? Or how can I shift how I think about this or how I deal with this um, to have a more positive attitude and to just make it better for you. Um, so looking on the brighter side, um, there was, you know what, I'm going to actually have to cheat and look at this because I can't remember what the other good thing is, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'm not going to live to be 100. I know what it was. It was worth looking. Okay. So sometimes I have patients who have the exact same problem. And sometimes that problem is that they need a walk to walk safely. And they don't want to have a walker to walk safely, right? I mean, we don't get a lot of people coming into my office and saying, ooh, you know, could, could you prescribe me a walker? Because I'm feeling good about that. that. That doesn't really happen. But here's what does happen. Some people get their walker and they think, ooh, I'm going to be on my walker. And everybody's going to see and they're going to know I'm old. OK, well, so on the first place, often it's already kind of apparent. So, um, so there's that. Uh, but, but probably more importantly, the people who say, I wish I didn't have a walker, but if the walker's going to keep me from falling down and keep me out of the hospital and the walker lets me keep going to the vintage house to hear a lecture or to dinner with my family, then I'm going to take the walker. And those people seem much happier. Why? Because they're still getting out. They're still doing all the things they enjoyed. They wish they didn't have the walker, but they've got the walker and they're working with it. And the other people are at home and they get more and more sad, right? So that's a way in which we can all say, I'm going to choose to make the best of what I have. And because I have this walker, I'm going off to the theater tonight. OK. So the three bears, too soft, too hard, just right. This has to do with planning. Planning doesn't happen as much as it might, right? And we talked about how, for the human race, so far, mortality is holding steady at 100%, right? So we can be ready or not. And frankly, for life, we can be this way, right? Most people want to stay in their homes, right? They're, they're not signing up to go somewhere else, although, you know, sometimes you do. If you want to stay in your home, what can you do in advance of the crisis? Because what happens, what I see often, is for people who haven't planned, the crisis happens, the adult children swoop in, right? They're busy and stressed. We already talked about how stressed middle-aged people are, right? It's terrible. They're stressed, and they're very worried about safety, and they're a little bit less worried about happiness and quality of life, because they're worried about safety, because they love their parents. And they feel like, if I just put them here, then I won't have to worry so much, right? But if you've planned, if you say, I've got this in place, I've got these rails, I've got this system, I, I don't need these stairs anymore, I don't need that room anymore, or I've already moved to a place that's going to work for me, then you have control. And that relates to planning about other things, too. You know, what do you want to have happen? What do you not want to have happen? Should the worst happen? And part of that it's really hard to predict, right? So probably one of the most important things you can do about planning is have one and maybe two people that you know know you and that you've told what you most hope for and what you most fear in your life. And people, those people that you can trust to make those decisions on your behalf in case you can't or to help you make those decisions when you're a little stressed because something's going on. So that's a little bit of a downer, right? maybe thinking about the bad things. But 
that gives us control. It keeps people independent. So I would really advise you to think about what's just right look like for you? What is it that you want and what is it that you don't want? And name some person officially. There are papers you can do this with. But what sometimes people do is they fill out the paper and they don't actually talk to the person whose name they write on the paper. Um, <laughs> that doesn't work so well. Really good to let the person know and also to tell them what you care about most and what you want to avoid most so they can help make good decisions. Okay, so a leap. Activity, learning, engagement, attitude, and planning. Five things we can all do to help as we age. And they're really interrelated. I mean, imagine if you start walking with a good friend while you know, helping each other make plans, or you know, you're chatting with the person, or you go learn a new skill with someone. Lots of ways of combining these and doing several at once. All right, before I close, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about geriatric medicine. So geriatrics is kind of like pediatrics, only pediatrics is for kids, geriatrics is for older adults. Uh, so this is Dr. Gawande again. And maybe six years ago, he wrote an article in The New Yorker where he said this. Most doctors treat disease and figure the rest will take care of itself. And if it doesn't, if a patient is becoming infirm and heading towards a nursing home, well, that isn't really a medical problem, is it? To a geriatrician, though, it is a medical problem. Why is it? Well, maybe I wouldn't call it a medical problem. I'd call it a health problem. I'd call it a life problem. So part of what I want you to do is to not a lot of medical professionals aren't really taught to think this way. And we're trying to change that. But in the interim, you're going to have to do it for yourselves and for the people you love to think about what matters most for your health and to insist that, like, remember the 101-year-old the with the two knees at the beginning? When a doctor says it's just because that knee is old, it might be that you need a new doctor, right? Okay. Or a new knee, right? <laughs> Very good. Um, so this was an article I wrote recently about a patient I met one evening uh, coming out of an appointment I was having. I was a patient. Uh, and I saw her going in and I saw her coming out. And she was in her 80s. I didn't know her. But by the time I came out of my appointment, it was dark. And she had a walker and she was just leaning there. And it turned out she'd been trying to get a cab unsuccessfully and her cell phone had died. And she had this cool thing on her cell phone which allowed her to call a cab really easily. The problem was it sent the cabs to her house and she was actually at the medical center. So technology can be really good, but you have to think through the, the process. Uh, so I helped call a cab and a cab came and then it saw her and I was helping her walk towards the car and she was Lovely, actually. Great sense of humor. We were having a good time. Um, she had a native San Franciscan as well. Uh, but she moved a little slowly, all the more so because she'd been standing there for an over an hour and it was freezing at this point. It was December. Uh, so the cab sees us moving slowly towards the curb and it takes off, right? Door open. So I hail another one. A, a cab comes from another company. It drives off too, right? I feel like this is a metaphor for what happens in society all the time, but also it's a specific cab problem. Anyway, I end up driving this woman home. She's now in our house calls practice. She's not my patient, but, um, but she is in our practice. And she had 49 steps, I think, up to her house. Right? There, were, there were some landings, and she had really bad arthritis. She had a host of medical problems. If we talked to her, you'd never really know. I mean, you could tell when she moved, but. She was fantastic. So she had, was only just retiring. I think she was 86 or 7. Um, because she'd been hospitalized a couple times the year before. Great sense of humor. We had a good time. It took a while to get up the steps, so we really got to know each other. Um, and, and she had a doctor for each part, right? She'd had a cancer, so she had a cancer doctor. Um, she had, what did she have? She had a general doctor. She had a lung doctor because she had asthma. I think she had a heart doctor. She had, I don't know, she had five or six of them. Um, and at the end, it just seemed like all the things that mattered to her most, which were that she couldn't really move without pain. She couldn't move very well and she was having trouble with the steps and she couldn't get transportation and she wasn't really getting enough help and she could have been working and doing all these other things if, if not for these problems. 
Anyway, so I asked, could I look in her record? And I looked. And she had been to our medical center almost 40 times in the past year for medical appointments. She had missed another handful because of the cab. Uh, her diseases were all really well controlled. But what she said to me was, my life is falling apart. Right? Her health was falling apart. So what each doctor was doing was taking care of their organ system or disease. right? And a bunch of them actually had documented what bothered her most, which was her pain and her joints and getting around uh, and, and some of her other problems like getting her medicines sometimes. But nobody had actually addressed them. And the reason for that is we don't teach people to do this. We teach them to take care of organ systems and diseases. And we're working on changing this. Um, one of my colleagues saw her, injected a couple of the joints, got the pharmacy to drop off the pills, um, figured out that she was paying. When she needed a cab, it cost her $3 per step in and back out, right? So if the doctor went to her, she actually didn't have to do that. And all the diseases were well controlled. Like the other doc, the specialist had done their, their bit. So she didn't actually need to see any of them. And with the money she saved, she could get someone help in the house to do the things she couldn't do, which allowed her to do some working part-time on her computer and spend more time with her friends. So we need to think more about people's lives and their health at least as much as we think about their medical care going forward. So we need to be careful about not just asking what's the matter with you, right? The medical question. And asking what matters to you, the health question. And you want to try and work with the people who take care of you and with your friends and family to really focus on what matters to you. Okay. On your mark. Yeah. These are people who have taken a leap. The idea is to compete and you don't have to win, but whenever you do win, it's a nice feeling. Winning is everything, Brad. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> Good guys finish last. Yeah. So I don't know if you can hear this guy's one guy says it, it's fun to compete, you don't have to and win. And the other guy says, Who are you kidding? It's I better to win. It's the fellow that I'm playing today is only ninety-four years old. So I play the youngster again. Well, it's jumping around. I'm not sure what's happening. Right. This guy's a hundred and that guy's ninety-four. I'm gonna stop it or maybe we can stop it. Can you stop it back there? You know the guy basin is a guy. Okay, stopped. So these are people who are actively engaged. I don't know if you could see, but one of them jumped a hurdle thing. I don't know about you, but I couldn't do that at 20, right? So <laughs> I don't think it would be good to try. You know, and, and are they moving slowly? They, they are moving more slowly than they used to, but they're moving. They're having a great time. And it's part of that attitude, which is probably partly why some of those people are in their 90s or 100s, and that's what we can do individually. But I think at least as important um, is what we can do as a society. So hopefully I've convinced you what you can do for yourself, but also what we need to do as a group. Um, so Abraham Lincoln said, in the end, it's not the years in your life that count. It's the life in your years. And we need to do that individually and collectively. Uh, that person here is my mother, who's in her early 80s, going off on her trip with her hiking poles, right? So she. You know, she walks fine, but she's going to use the two poles, right? So that, that's a little like the walker, not quite there yet. She would like to have, she doesn't have as many outfits as she'd ideally have, but she can lift this suitcase, right? And it's a light special suitcase. And admittedly, she has some advantages that she has those options. Um, but I hope I can respond in that way when I get to her age. She had been widowed less than a year when, this, when she went off on this trip. So, you know, attitude, activity, et cetera. Um, and with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. I know Dr. Aronson is going to be willing to answer all of your questions, but I'd just like to make a comment how fortunate we were to have her and how fortunate the University of California, which is where I spent my whole career is, to have her as a faculty member teaching the future generation of doctors. What a wonderful person with wonderful ideas and a terrific approach 
to medicine, which I certainly didn't experience in my generation. Thank you so much, Louis. So we do have time for questions. Um, is there, are there people with mics? Anybody raise their hand, I'll bring the mic. You did, you, you did. I can repeat also. <laughs> well, you didn't talk uh, very much about uh, keeping your mind active, uh, and I wondered if you had certain um, recommendations, was it learning new languages or whatever, that uh, we could profit from. Uh -huh. So more specific recommendations about uh, keeping your mind active. What well, turns out it kind of doesn't matter what you do, on the one hand, for what we know now. People are studying this now. They, as, as part of this attitude of like you get old, you lose your mind, people only recently started studying what we can do to not have that happen. Um, so we, they haven't looked at too many specific things, but it turns out whatever you're learning, it's just learning something new you didn't know before. So it can be a language, it can be a craft, it can be reading a book and learning and looking up words, um, it can be an activity, it really doesn't matter. What you wanna be doing is sort of stretching your brain in ways you didn't before and making sure you're learning. Um, one good way of doing this that, that you know, people are selling these tests and, and sort of activities that you can do to engage your brain. Um, and that'll cost you money, and if you find them fun, great. I, you know, there's some data on some of them. But for free, <laughs> you know, you can go somewhere and take classes, right? I, there must be things here where you can do that. There's, yeah, lots of them, yeah. In San Francisco, there's the Fromm Institute, and people go and take classes and learn things and discuss with each other, right? So then you get the social engagement, you get the learning. Um, depending on how you get there, you could do some walking to find your classroom, right? So you can really add them in. But it really doesn't matter what you learn. So I think it's a bit like exercise. You have to pick something you actually want to learn or you'll stop doing it. Right? So it doesn't matter so much which exercise you do or what you learn, it has to be something you're gonna keep doing. That's probably its most important characteristic. So, good and bad news. Yes. There seem to have always been enough pediatricians around to serve as primary care physicians for infants. Is there any hope that that'll become the case with geriatricians and seniors? So this is like my life's work in the past few months. Um, uh, let's see. Probably not in the near future, but, uh, but with a few caveats. Number one, finally, students are starting to really be interested in larger numbers. Um, we just looked at our life cycle course. <laughs> it's changing, but our life cycle course has 87 modules. Four of them are on aging. Four. Right, there's basically nothing between 20 and 75, and then there's four modules on 75 up. Anyway, um, but the students were saying we didn't get enough, and that didn't used to happen. Uh, and we're finding more and better trainees. But it takes a lot of years to make a doctor. So we're not gonna have enough in time. What we're trying to do now is A, change the rules, so the other thing that happens in medical school is that there are required rotations. And this is true also in nursing and pharmacy and social work. It's like across the health professions. Um, where everybody has to have a certain amount of different things, including pediatrics. Uh, but there's no requirement for geriatrics. And yet, so kids are 20% of the population and they're about 6% of hospitalized patients. And, and that's good, like we don't need more sick children in the world, that would be horrible, right? You know, I'm not, not saying we need more sick children by any means. Uh, but older adults are currently 14% of the population and they tend to be over 50% of the hospital days and so we teach what? We teach nothing. It's insane. Um, so we need to change the requirements. I'm hoping that will happen in the next five years. Uh, the other thing we need to do is teach everyone who takes care of older adults how to take care of older adults, right? Um, you, you know that you, 
don't want to take your kid to an adult doctor because there's very good evidence that the adult doctor won't do as good a job. Well, the exact same thing has been shown with older adults, and yet we don't really train people. Um, we're going to start, and more and more people are showing interest. Previously, it was a hard sell. But increasingly, people are recognizing they don't know what they need to know. Um, so, so, you know, emphasizing training people in what's different and how the approach is different is going to be our best bet. Because if you look at different fields, um, they spend somewhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time, and that's whether you're an eye doctor or a neurologist or an orthopedist or a general surgeon or an internist or a cardiologist or a cancer doctor or anything else. They're taking care of lots of old people. And, and old people are the people most likely to be harmed by medications and by treatments and to get care that isn't in keeping with what they really want. Um, I don't know if, if any of you ever want to look. There's a journal called Health Affairs. And there's a piece this month. Um, they have a section called Narrative Matters, which is basically stories. So it's not all the other articles you may or may not be interested in, but this Narrative Matters things. And there's a woman talking about her 94-year-old mother going to the hospital. And this woman apparently was the head of the Denver Health System, a physician, and had advocated for standard approaches all her career and had been really proud of their better outcomes with standard approaches. And then she shows up with her 94-year-old um, mother who had fairly advanced dementia. And she realizes that every step along the way, the standard care would only do harm to her mother. And she says, I was right about standards sometimes, right? But, but we need different standards. The way you take care of a, a healthy 50-year-old must be different than the way you take care of you know, a person in their 90s. So I think we're going to make progress. But you're right. We need, we need geriatricians the way we need pediatricians. And not in the foreseeable future, but we're working towards it. OK, quick follow-up then. Are you accepting new patients? <laughs> I actually, there's a whole group of us who do good things, but um, yes, in San Francisco. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Dr. Aronson. Um, we really enjoyed it. I, I just wanted to give a shout out for um, for yoga as a as a as in particular the women. Um, I noticed that in your your pictures, there's a lot of men stuff, and guys are, tend towards doing things like that. Um, my mom turned 90 a couple of years ago, and uh, somebody just kind of on a fluke recommended we check out the yoga up here, and we can't stop, you know? It's and it's, and it's, a, it's a growing community of, of aging, but it's certainly made um, our time together more valuable and, and uh, enriched. And um, it's something that we're able to do together. And I think that people are afraid that they can't start at any p point. But she's 90, 92 now. Been doing it almost three years now. Right. So. That's great. Yoga, Tai Chi, both, you know, they're really good. And those have some advantages in a couple of ways. Um, one is you're building strength. And the other is you're building balance. So really helpful for falls, for tension for all kinds of things. So yeah, yoga and Tai Chi are both great. The one thing, there's a great Tai Chi study um, where if somebody has already had a fall, it's really bad to start in Tai Chi by standing on one foot, right? <laughs> you heard it here first. Hello, hello, hello. Go. Um, I had just kind of a specific question uh, It had to do with the planning issue. Um, this, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but I live in a condominium where there's a couple of steps out in front of my uh, front door and a couple of steps in the back and my wife's a little clumsy and she's kind of concerned about as we do get a little bit older tripping and we've had a couple issues and since we live in a condominium um, I've called uh, the person in charge the president to find out what the possibility of having I've seen portable ramps I've seen the possibility of maybe putting in some railing along the sides of the steps to help stabilize things and I was just wondering if you knew uh, what the specific laws regarding that kind of stuff was and if you didn't know what resources might be available that I could, I could uh, look into to possibly find out um, if we can have ramps, and not right at this point, but for the future. Uh, she's re her mother fell and broke her hip, and like you say, it was sort of the beginning of the end for her, and we just want to prevent that if possible, as That's well as great. friends and neighbors that come by to visit, and we're all getting a little older and a little clumsier, so. Right, and imagine if we just built buildings that we could all age in, right? Because it actually, it costs the same to build it the right way in the first place. 
but we don't think of it. I see a bunch of patients in apartment buildings in San Francisco that have elevators, which sounds great, right? Except for at the bottom of the elevator is often eight steps to the sidewalk, right? Probably, I figure, it was built for young mothers with a couple of children and a few bags of groceries. Right, but now, now we have a different situation. So to answer your question, I don't actually know the laws on condos. I do think we need to be advocating that new building must be, you know, they, they put in new building must deal with earthquakes or new buildings have other safety measures. Um, so people who deal with disability rights, maybe, um, local government statues, I mean, you can appeal to the people. It's far better for them to put in a rail than to have someone fall. So we just, we have somebody here who's a wonderful example of staying active and exercising. Howard is 91 years old and he takes part in yoga and... Yes, I come to yoga and I come tomorrow morning. If you want to sign up, class starts at, <laughs> class starts at 9.30 and to get here I walk a quarter of a mile and then I walk a quarter of a mile to go home. We'll see you tomorrow. Excellent. I've That's got a great. question for, for Dr. Aaron. How did you get interested in it? Or another way of asking is why the attrition and That's not a, good a question. cardiac surgeon? <laughs> well, first I thought I'd be a pediatrician, and then I did pediatrics, and it felt to me like child torture. Like, there was one night we were sticking this two-year-old and she's screaming, why, mommy, why? And we're sticking the needle in her and it goes on and on. And that was it. So that was it for peds. Anyway, then I found I really liked adults. So, but I still didn't think I would do geriatrics. And then um, I was just in training. And I think two things happened. One was I had a clinic that happened to be older. I mean, people would get different clinics, like this person has people with, a lot of people with heart disease, and I just happened to get a fair number of older patients. Um, and I found I loved it. And I think I loved it for a few reasons. One is I really, uh, pe people make jokes in medicine, I love science, I love people, or whatever. And I love people, and I like science a lot. Um, but, but I wouldn't say, you know, some people are in it for the science. I never was. And if you like people, chances are you like stories. And the longer people have lived, as we saw, they have more experience, better stories. There's just, I don't know, there's more of a human being there than a 20-year-old, and I find that interesting. So I liked that. Um, I also like that in order to take care of an older adult, you can't just deal with the problem. You have to know the person. It's kind of related. But if a 20-year-old breaks their leg, you can put a cast on it, hand them some crutches, and say bye, right? But if someone was already a little unstable and they break their leg, then maybe they can't use crutches so well. Um, and, and how are they going to negotiate what they need to do? So you need to know who they are and where they live and who's in their social network. And you need to think more creatively about how we're going to keep this person fit while the cast's on. How are we going to deal with the other medical problems? Who are we going to call? How are we? And I like all that stuff. Some people don't. They just want to put a cast on. But that does, you know, one cast is like the next, but one person is entirely distinct from the next. And so it's fun to deal with those challenges. And I think that's where we get into trouble with aging too, is people think like, oh, that's horrible and complicated. Well, most of the things worth doing are complicated and require creativity. And meeting it in that way is fun. So that was how I ended up. I just, it, I didn't mean to. <laughs> also had a great grandfather. Excuse me. Ellen? Yep. Hi, my name is Natasha Lubin, and around here I'm known as the lady with the stick because that's my thing. I've just started a new organization which falls right into what you're talking about, and I'm calling it Evolving, and I had to put in the incorporated, otherwise I couldn't incorporate the name. So it's Evolving, Inc., and it deals with exactly what you're talking about. We meet the uh, second Thursday of every month in the Village Green, and it's, it's basically looking at, it's open to all ages. So we're there to help one another and talk about our experiences and just sort of look at where we're going and what we're doing and help each other piece these things together. So I will leave, if it's all right with you, a brochure with my phone number. So if anybody is interested, I'd be delighted to see you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Well, let's take one more question. Is there art or maybe there aren't any? Okay, um, 
Again, Louise, if I may call you Louise, thank you so much for a wonderful hour and a half. Um, I know many of us wish there were more geriatric doctors available that we could take advantage of, and UC does have a geriatric clinic. You have how many physicians practicing geriatric medicine at UC? Ooh, we have almost 30 now, although in different parts of the health system. So, but they're, yeah, they're in different hospitals. They're in and different, different hospitals different and clinics. And we so all on. do four million things, um, so it sounds better but, than it but actually is. I really is. look forward to the days when we have more general physicians, internists, or family practitioners who are trained in geriatrics like they're trained in cardiology or endocrinology or rheumatology or whatever. It's such an important part of medicine. Um, thank you again so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you.